Thank you.
you may be seated. Yeah. yeah. Well, well, happy Palm Sunday, everyone, and welcome to church. Welcome to church on this day where Jesus triumphantly comes into Jerusalem in our narrative, but also into our hearts and into our very lives. I just want to make sure that everyone got a palm branch. Uh, if in the middle of the service, you know, you're, you're, you're feeling, you're feeling adventurous, just wave it in the air like you don't care. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, uh, make, make sure, sure you also got, got a, a palm cross to take home with you. A, it could be used as a bookmark, you know, or a pen or anything like that. And then also, um, want to make sure that um, the children's um, are where they are so that the children's message can be seen uh, on the screens uh, when that time happens. And I also got a, a, a treat. Uh, at the end of the service, I'm going to be directing us to something special. So. Uh, I want to make sure that, uh, uh, that everyone is just sort of prepared to do that. So make sure you, know, you don't lose your things of where you are. Make sure you're, you're able to gather them around. All right. My name is Dan, and I have the privilege and the absolute joy to serve as pastor here at Gum Spring United Methodist Church. Uh, I want to greet everyone who's also joining us online. God bless you where you are, and I hope and I pray uh, that this service, as Jesus enters this church and into the folks that are here, Jesus would also enter where you are, uh, into your hearts and into your homes as well. And thank you so much for inviting us into your homes on this Palm Sunday morning. Uh, we want that to be a community for you, so... Uh, if, if you, you can, can register, register, there is a, a sort of friendship, friendship registration to sign up. If you're on, on the web page, if you're on Roku, you can also comment there. If you're on uh, Facebook or YouTube, you can also comment there. We check all of those. If you have a prayer request, lift all of those up, and we'll be sure to send out those prayer requests so that we are getting as many people praying for you as possible. And of course, you know, just say hello and amen because it lets us know that you are well, well. Uh, I, I just, just have, have a couple, couple of announcements for this morning. Uh, the first is, you know, you know this, this is the beginnings of Holy Week, week seven days from today, where we will have Easter Sunday. And you know, a lot can happen in seven days. A lot did happen a long time ago during that seven days, and a lot can happen today. And so I want to share that we have a Monday Thursday service that's online only, but in with Bethel, Bethel United Methodist Church on Zoom. And so, so that's, that's going to be at 7 o'clock. The best way to connect uh, is through Zoom on that. that. So just, just you know, uh, uh, call, call me or email me if you have any questions about, about you know, how, how to get, get that working. working. Of course, that service will be live streamed as well on our Facebook page. So you can just join us in that way too. Um, Easter Sunday. Easter Sunday. By, by, back by, by popular, popular demand. demand. And, and we, we have, have some, some early risers, risers here, so... <laughs> we, we are going, going to have an 8.30 service, service every single Sunday thereafter, starting with next Sunday, uh, uh, Easter, Easter Sunday. Sunday. Next Sunday, Easter, um, it, it's, it's going to be a special one because we're going to have the morning service outside. Weather permitting, of course. And it's, it's going, going to be um, at the, uh, the stainless steel cross, cross over there. there. Uh, by, by the, the, uh, uh, the majestic, majestic field, field. I, just I just want to say, say whatever, whatever it's called. called. Um, the magical the place over there. there. Uh, <laughs> bring uh, the, the, what, the prayer garden? garden? Prayer garden. Thank, Thank you so much for giving it an official name. name. The prayer garden. garden. Um, um, and, and so, so uh, I, I want to invite you to bring your own chairs, chairs for that. Uh, because we, we don't have chairs. We do if you forgot one. But let me just invite you to bring your own chairs for that. Mike, Mike, Melvin, and, and I will just, just be the two of us leading y'all in some uh, good old casual uh, uh, 8.30 Sunday Easter, Easter morning worship service. service. And, and of course, we will have an 11 a.m. worship uh, Easter, Easter morning uh, Resurrection Sunday service right here with, with a baptism, with Holy Communion, with, with all of the parts, especially you all, and, and your company, and your fellowship here that make that worship so special. And of course, you know, we will be greeting the risen Lord on that day. So uh, let me just uh, invite you to those services um, uh, as you are available to them. 
uh, we are continuing with the mask ministry. All of those funds go to uh, our missions ministry. And there's some really cool Easter masks out there. Easter colored. Deb makes some really, really cool ones that fit really, really well. Let me encourage you to stop by that table over there and get some. Uh, I have a, a bit of a, of a sad news. Um, we had to postpone our Easter egg hunt. Uh, it's just too muggy outside, and there's a call for some kind of thunderstorm, severe weather this afternoon, and so we just, out of an abundance of caution, you know, we, we wanted to postpone it. So we will be postponing it to next Sunday, you know, Lord willing, uh, next Sunday at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. Just want to thank ahead of time all of those that were prepared for that today all of the volunteers. And so uh, if you are available, we'd love for you to be, uh, to come out uh, to sort of change your schedule a little bit or shift your schedule so that we can have an Easter egg hunt uh, next Sunday at three o'clock here at church. Uh, and of course, uh, the youth groups, they happen uh, every single Sunday afternoon at four o'clock right here at church. See Aaron, contact Aaron, our youth leader for those details. All right, all right. Let us prepare our hearts. Let us prepare our minds. Let us prepare all that we are to receive our Lord Jesus Christ that comes triumphantly into our hearts. Would you rise as you are able and join with me in the call to worship that can be found on the bulletins and on the screens following along in the bold. Let us worship the Lord, not just with our voices, but also with our entire being. We gather to worship. Your presence demands our participation. Our worship is never wasteful. Be gracious to us, O oh Lord. We are your servants. Empty us for your use. We are Christ's servants, and may we be of the same mind. We declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Praise be unto God. Amen. Remain standing as you are able, and let me invite you to sing with your hearts and with your souls. Now I know, I know, this Sunday demands that we would sing with our voices. But for this hymn, let, let me invite you to sing with our hearts and in our souls and to have this piano be the spirit that is lifted up for this morning. And then at the end, at the end, save your voice for then. Amen. You may be seated.
Let us join our hearts and our voices together with this opening prayer. Holy One, you have come in God's name and for our sake. You have entered our souls in moments of shouted hosannas and waving cloaks. And you have come just the same to our late nights and our confused hearts. Come to us again, dear one, and let us follow you. Let your name be on our tongue and in our hearts. Amen. Our scripture passage for this morning comes from two places, the book of Psalm and the Gospel of Mark. I'll be reading from the book of Psalm first. These come from the NRSV version. Let us now hear the word of the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let Israel say his steadfast love endures forever. Open to me the gates of righteousness that I may enter through them and give thanks to the Lord. This is the gate of the Lord. The righteous shall enter it. I thank you that you have answered me and become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Save us, we beseech you, O Lord. O Lord, we beseech you. Give us success. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. We bless you from the house of the Lord. The Lord is God, and he has given us light. Blind the festal procession with branches up to the horns of the altar. You are my God, and I will give thanks to you. You are my God, and I will extol you. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his steadfast love endures forever. And now reading from the Gospel of Mark, chapter 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, And immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. And if anyone says to you, well, why are you doing this? Just say the Lord needs of it and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. And as they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said and then they allowed them to take it. Then they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest of heaven. Then he entered Jerusalem and went into the temple And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, let me uh, direct all of the attention of our young people here, and frankly, all of us, because this is really cool, uh, to the children's message uh, that is provided by Esther. Hi friends. So today is a very special day. As you probably already know, it's called Palm Sunday. So today is a beginning marker for this week called Holy Week that we Christians celebrate. It's a week that leads to Easter. But before we get there, Jesus had to go to Jerusalem first. So he rides on the humble donkey And then when he marches in, people shout, Hosanna, which means save us. So he is celebrated as king of peace as he enters into the city. So it's a beginning of his hard journey that's going to be coming up soon. But this is all how it started. Hope you enjoyed today's story. Today's message comes from Book of John, Chapter 12. Verses 12 through 19. 
Jesus asked two of his followers to bring him a baby donkey from nearby village. And just tell those who may ask, Our Lord needs it. Hosanna! <laughs> He was the man who raised Lazarus from the dead. Not to mention, his followers say he did some amazing things. He must be the king we were waiting for! But not everyone was happy about Jesus. Knowing what was waiting for him, he looked up to Jerusalem and wept. Little did his followers know what is to come only in few days. Jesus marched into Jerusalem, surrounded by people's praises and in celebration. But we all know why he really went into Jerusalem. It was for him to get arrested, to get judged by high priests, and ultimately to get executed on the cross. And he knew all of this was coming. But on Easter, on the third day after he gets crucified, what happens? He rises again. And he shows us that he is truly our king. Let us pray. Father, thank you so much for this ultimate gift that you have given us, our Lord Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins so that we may have personal relationship with you. Help us to remember what you have done for us this week. Help us to celebrate it with our families and friends, to strengthen each other, to help and remind each other of who you are to us. We love you too, Lord. And in Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Okay, so until next time, bye. Amen. Uh, thank you, Esther. All right, let me invite all the children to meet uh, Esther and Anna back there for Children's Church. All right, have a good one. And then um, uh, let's all, uh, so when Mike, uh, this is an original of his, and he created just for this Palm Sunday. And so, um, gosh, I really want us to receive this incredible gift of song uh, that he has for us uh, called When He Paid, When He Paid for All My Sins. I can see the palm leaves waving, I can hear the people cheer, I can hear them sing Hosanna as the time for me draws near, I can hear disciples saying, I won't deny my king, I can hear myself saying, that their words don't mean a thing And I can feel the nails I can feel that crown of thorns And I 
can hear his cries. I can see the storm clouds form, but I will never know what he gave me from within his precious soul. He paid for all my sins. I can feel the lashes on my chest. I can hear them shout for more. I can hear them vote to lead that man to wrap us out the door. I can feel my legs collapsing under that old cross I bore. I can hear me ask forgiveness. For the sinners I adore And I can feel the nail I can feel that crown of thorns And I can hear the cries I can see the storm clouds form But I will He paid for all my sins He can feel the pain You're living with today He can hear your cries Feel the joy And the fears that lie ahead Put them all aside And just trust in him I can hear him say I love you He paid for all our sins Can you feel the nail? Can you feel that crown of thorns? Can you hear their cries? See the storm clouds form, but we will never know what he gave us from within his precious soul, but he paid for all our sins. Amen. Amen. M- Mike, I know you're tuned in on this live stream. Um, and so I just want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. That beautiful and moving and touching song. You know, it is. It can't be any bit of a better of a song for today because today, rightly so, is Palm Passion Sunday. It's Palm Passion Sunday. Because we know that on this day, the same ones who would shout, Hosanna, save us on the streets would also be the same ones who would shout, crucify him as he goes to the cross. And so we live in that tension for today, where in the beginning, yes, there's celebrations, there's cheers, but towards the end, we know where this journey to Jerusalem will lead Jesus and the direction in which Jesus calls us as well. Palm Passion Sunday. This is not a part of my sermon, but gosh. Uh, (laughs) You know, I, I saw this the other day, uh, and, and it reminds me of a question that I was asked, you know, when I was younger. You know, Dan, if you had one day to live, what would you do? Oh, my gosh. Well, first it started with a joke. It's like if you only had a dollar on the last day that you would live, what would you spend it on? Well, obviously, I'd, save it on a, I'd spend it on a lifesaver. <laughs> okay, all right. Anyways, but, but the question was, uh, but the question was, Dan, what would you do on the last day? 
you know, here on Earth, the last day, and I'd be, I'd live it up. You know, there'd be no consequences. You know, kind of like Groundhog Day, right? I'd live it up, do whatever I want, you know, without any single consequence in the world, fulfilling my, all of my desires. Until it struck me, Jesus knew on his, the, his last day, and do you know what he spent doing it? He spent his last day washing the disciples' feet. And that just, that wrecks me, knowing that. So that will lead us to Monday, Thursday. But for now, I do want to talk about Palm Sunday and this triumphant entrance into Jerusalem uh, that Jesus makes on this sort of uh, curious animal, this curious animal. Uh, I'm going to play a little bit of a, of a game with you, kind of like a Jeopardy uh, thing. Uh, I'm going to give you the answer. It's, going to, it's a long-winded one, but I want you to guess. Uh, well, no, I would give you the question, right? And then uh, you would guess the answer, right? So let's see if you can uh, get this one right. Who is, on January 19th, 1935, a two-year-old thoroughbred horse with noticeably knobby knees and finicky temper and a relatively small stature made his racing debut at Hylia Park, Florida. A true underdog in the races that nobody would look twice at for this horse to race. He finished fourth overall, which surprised many because they were expecting him to come dead last. Still, the horse had a very poor start in his race to life and in his first uh, races so poorly in the first 17 races that he became the butt of jokes in the barns, you know, threatening to probably use him as a training horse or something. But there was a spirit about this horse, something intangible about the fight in him. A year later, a trainer saw that too, that spirit, and that trainer's name was Tom Smith, who he himself was an unusual and unorthodox trainer, never really having a winning career himself. And his jockey, named Johnny Red Pollard, was also an unusual jockey because, well, he wasn't exactly jockey-sized, and he was blind in one eye. Standing at about five foot seven, which is five inches taller than the average jockey and about 20 pounds heavier, they would invest into this and believe into this horse. They saw something that others didn't, a heart, a spirit, a hope, that frankly America needed at that time. It was a time of Great Depression where hope was the only thing that people had to carry them through, and even that was fleeting. People craved to hold on to something, something that would bring them joy and happiness and the belief that even in the worst of times, there would be something to rejoice in. After some time, Tom and Johnny, uh, which was all it took, just a little bit of time, just two people believing in this horse with a dash of hope, this horse would start winning and winning to be the highest earning race horse ever. During his career of 89 starts, the horse would win 33 times with 15 second places and 13 third places. Of course, the greatest race came in November 1st, 1938, against the Triple Crown winner and heavy favorite, heavy favorite, War Admiral, uh, in a race known as the Race of the Century. This was a true David and Goliath kind of race. Well, we all know the story of how David and Goliath turned out, right? This turned out very similar. It wasn't even close. War, War Admiral would lose handedly by four lengths, and this winning horse would be named Horse of the Year, a true rags to riches story that captured hearts of America that so desperately needed to believe that greatness isn't a condition that you're born into, nor is it a matter of your circumstances. Greatness is the amount of heart and courage that you can muster in the face of adversity because someone believed in you. So for, you know, at least $400 on Jeopardy, <laughs> can anyone name this horse? Sea Biscuit. Sea Biscuit. Right. 
I find that amazing. That story just sounds amazing. Now, I don't know anything about horses, though it certainly sounded like I did, right? <laughs> sea biscuit versus war handle, you know, and I looked it up a little bit, and sea biscuit was actually the sort of hard tax that you would give to like Navy officers and stuff as they eat for meals. If you think about that, the food, the, you know, this, this little gangly horse was named after the food that the sailors would eat versus a horse named War Admiral. <laughs> so you know when I read the Bible, uh, usually I will read it in a way that I find myself relating to the characters of it. Like in the Gospels, um, you know, it's, which is all about Jesus. Interestingly, you know, I, I hardly ever relate to Jesus. Because although I aspire to be like him in the Gospels, you know, his teachings and his mannerisms, his behaviors, and all that he did, I definitely aspire to be. But when I try to do that, I know I can't relate as much because I failed. But still, Jesus came, God came in human form as Jesus to experience all that we could experience so that we could relate directly to him. No other worldview or religion has that. So sometimes I do resonate and relate to Jesus in the Gospels. But most of the time, I find myself relating to the disciples, these sort of like dumbfounded guys, you know, who are just like wondering what's going on and who is this guy. And sometimes they get it right and sometimes they get it wrong. But they were utterly transformed in the process. Other times, I will find myself relating to the sinner, the lame, the blind, the poor, the pitiful, and I know that Jesus offers me mercy. Oftentimes, oftentimes, I find myself relating to the Pharisees, those that would judge or that are unable to sympathize or exercise authority over and try to trap Jesus in his own teachings and find contradictions in him. Honestly, ever since I became a pastor and got this sort of theological training, I find myself, unfortunately, relating to the Pharisees a lot, which wrecks me. But for the first time ever, for the first time ever in reading the Gospels, I find myself relating to a surprising character. And this character isn't even a human. Each gospel has its own version of Jesus triumphantly entering Jerusalem, all of them lifting up certain details about it. But there was something about Mark's version here that we read this morning that's really speaking to me and one that I want to share with you. Why? Because no other gospel goes into this much detail about this young donkey, this cult. Mark is the shortest of the Gospels, and yet Mark spends seven verses, more than any of the Gospels, describing this exchange with Tony, the donkey, apparently that's his name. <laughs> Who came up with that? I don't know. Describing this back and forth that the disciples had with the donkey. And the more times I read it, the more, you know, I'm like, oh my Lord, I'm the donkey in this story. Let me refresh your memory. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethpage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and he said to them, go into the village ahead of you and immediately as you enter it, you will find tied there a colt, tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it to me. The first thing about this colt that was absolutely speaking to me was that this colt was tied up. Tied up in knots, tied up to something. And Jesus had sent his disciples to untie him and bring him, bring the donkey to him. In other translations, it says to loosen the colt. Right? Or release the cult. Release the kraken. I don't know why that came up to me. Here is a question that I asked myself, perhaps helpful for you. What am I tied to? What are you all tied to? What, what, what's got you in knots? What's got you so wound up and, and bound to something 
to which God must first loosen in order to use you for the gospel. You know, there was a time in high school when I actually believed that women could not be pastors or preachers. I had read my Bible through and through, and there were these passages, particularly in the epistles of Paul, that explicitly said that women should be silent in the church. Now, it's not like I was ardently against women preachers or anything like that. I just knew that this is what the Bible had said, and I sort of took that as to be the case. But I never really wrestled with it. I never really struggled with it, although in my heart I knew this was something worth wrestling over. That was until I went to a youth retreat where the keynote speaker was a Korean woman. And she preached the word of God like never heard it preached before, so much more powerfully than my own youth pastor. No offense to him, he had other gifts. And in that sermon, she shared this one bit of information that would forever change my life, that loosened my life of this assumption. She said that the first preacher in the Gospels that Jesus himself had commanded to go preach was the women at the empty tomb. They were the first to see the risen Lord, and when they saw the resurrected Jesus, it was on their testimony and their preaching and their witness of the Gospel that would be shared first and foremost and throughout the area. And Jesus said explicitly to them, as I had heard it when I was called into ministry, go and tell others. I had to be untied. I had to be loosened of my assumptions and presuppositions so that Christ could bring me to him and use me as a preacher and as a pastor. What things must Christ untie in you? What ideas or perhaps addictions or grudges or assumptions or preconceived notions are you keeping, it's keeping you tied to a post from which God is calling you forth? The second thing about this cult is that, well, it's never been ridden before. That's curious. You know, a, a colt, donkey, or any animal that's rideable, for that matter, like a camel or an elephant that's never been ridden before, screams just one thing to me, loud and clear, and it is this, don't ride me. <laughs> or at least don't be the first to ride him, right? I'll be the second, or the third, or the fourth, or how could it be the first? An animal that's never been ridden before? Uh-uh. I just can't imagine, you know, being those humans a long time ago, looking at an elephant and be like, you know what? I'm going to ride that. <laughs> what? I wonder how many people said that, <laughs> but never actually got to. Oh, gosh. All right. You know, that, that's what that screams out to me. Never been ridden before. Because the colt was either too young or too weak for anyone to ride just yet. Just the other day, you know, Esther uh, showed me a children's book called uh, The Donkey That No One Could Ride. Raise your hand if you've heard this book before. Oh, good, good, good. It's by Anthony Tony. <laughs> Anthony Di Stefano, uh, Di Stefano, illustrated by Richard Caudre. And uh, here is a picture of that book. Yeah. The Donkey That No One Could Ride. It's a touching book, uh, one that I think we as adults all should read because the lesson of that book is so simple yet so powerful. It's basically about this donkey that was born very weak and practically useless his whole life. The donkey couldn't pull anything or haul anything or as a result was ridiculed by its owners and, and others. And then Jesus comes along and then approaches the donkey so that he may ride atop him and into Jerusalem. But the donkey doesn't volunteer right away, right? In fact, there were reasons that this little donkey gave to Jesus. And I need to read you these reasons because they certainly sound like something that I would say. 
What's that you say? Cried the donkey with dread. There's simply no way, you've been misled. I'm just a small weakling, you must go ahead and look for another to take you instead. You see, I'm just hopeless ever since I was born. I've been subject to insults and teasing and scorn. My back's somewhat crooked, my legs aren't strong. I'm just a big failure who does everything wrong. Won't you believe me, the sad donkey cried. Just leave me alone and cast me aside. I'm just a poor donkey that no one can ride. When the Lord wants you to use you for something, what sort of reasons or objections or excuses or fears do you offer? And if Jesus asked us to follow him into Jerusalem and into ministry and into service and into sharing the gospel, would we be able to do so without hesitation? Perhaps yes, if we knew that all that Jesus was following us to was to celebrations and shouts of Hosanna and a party. But would we hesitate if we knew that the journey would take us all the way to the cross when Jesus explicitly said it himself, to take up your cross and follow me to mine? Today is Palm Sunday, Palm Passion Sunday. And Jesus has finally made his way to Jerusalem, the city at the center of their social, religious, and political life. It would be the happening place at that time, even more so because of the season of Passover. Think of it as Times Square on New Year's Eve or Washington, D.C. on Inauguration Day or Gum Spring, Virginia on Wonderful Wednesday. It is the most happening place there is. Guarantee it, you need to come by. It's the center. And of course, Jesus would have to eventually make his way there because that's exactly what's expected of him, right? As this sort of new revolutionary, this sort of uh, new king, this new messiah that would come to overthrow Rome and to put everyone in their place, to to corrupt religious leaders, elite, back into their rightful place and to usher in this new kingdom that would happen right before their eyes. For many that were uh, experiencing that, especially those that were cheering them on, Hosanna and save us, the occasion would be the beginnings of this newfound freedom without the oppression of Rome, kicking Rome out of their cities and this newfound kingdom, this kingdom of God. And yet, I know every single one of us has read the gospel of Mark. As readers of the gospel, we know that his entry into Jerusalem wasn't the beginning of the end of Rome. It was the end of the beginning of Jesus. Because remember, up until this time, Jesus was doing ministry in the outskirts and, you know, in in the outcasts around the Sea of Galilee and through Samaria, and he spent the bulk of his time with people who didn't live at the centers of society, and he spent his time with outliers and the marginalized, the sinner, the leper, the blind, the lame, the widow, the poor. And in Mark 1, Jesus was baptized by the river Jordan by John the Baptist, who himself was a bit of an outcast. And then he immediately makes his way to the wilderness, not to the center, to the wilderness, to be tempted by Satan. And then he moves along to the beaches of the Sea of Galilee, calling his disciples unto him, first Simon and his brother Andrew, and then Zebedee and his brother John, fishermen. Fishermen of all people, not exactly the the makings of a political or social revolution. I know if I were to start something like that, I would try and recruit, you know, soldiers or, or public leaders, you know, or wealthy businessmen. Anybody but fishermen. Friends, I say this as a reminder that this Jesus who comes into Jerusalem in the midst of our shouts and our praise comes to this city for one purpose and one purpose only. Not to conquer others, but to surrender himself. Not to start a a revolution, but to finish his work of reconciliation. Not to hurl and overthrow the powerful, but to heal the hurting and the broken and the brokenhearted. When we shout Hosanna to Jesus, praising him and cheering him on with our adoration and follow him into the center of the city, into the center of our lives, into the center of our world, my question is, do we really know why he's here? 
do we really know the end to which he is inviting us? Are we prepared to follow him all the way, knowing that it will take us to the cross? I struggle. I struggle. I have excuses upon excuses upon excuses to not give it my all. Like that donkey, reasons after reasons to not give it my all. let me end with the response that Jesus gave to the donkey. And may we hear this for ourselves. Let's put up that slide. It's such a, a beautiful picture. Jesus said, my help is enough. It's all that you need. It's all that you require in life to succeed. The weaker you are, the more strength I give. I'll be there to help you as long as you live. I know you feel tired and frightened and broken, but do you believe these words that I've spoken? Do you believe? I ask you again, do you have faith? I can heal you, my friend. And if so, may all of God's people say, Amen. We come now to a time of the affirmation of faith in the Apostles' Creed. Let us stand as we are able and join our voices together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead, and on the third day he rose again, and he ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and of life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. In front of you now is a slide of all the ways in which you may offer your tithes and your gifts. We also have offering plates that are out there as well. We also have a locked uh, mailbox uh, that's out there as well by PayPal or checks through the mail. I just want to thank you in advance for all the ways in which you have supported the ministries of this church by your gifts, your tithes, but also by your prayers, your presence, your witness. Your just being here is a gift. It is a gift that is in response to the grace of God that came even before you realized it. And so I just want to thank you. And I know the Lord will bless you multiply that blessings because your gift when you give becomes a multiplied blessing for others. We do more together, folks. We do more together than we could do ourselves. So, let us uh, pray over our offering together. Gracious God, you have given us blessings beyond measure. Hearts of mercy, hands of grace and in the presence of Christ and in our soul and in our lives. We can never repay what we have received, so help us carry it forward. May we use these gifts of hearts and hands to sustain the weary in word and in deed. May we be awakened to all who long for God's peace and have courage enough to walk with them. Amen. We come now to a time of the prayers of the people and the Lord's Prayer. Friends, there is much to pray for these days. We're continuing to pray for Frank and Jean Howarth. Continue to pray for Lee and Ray Crumpler. We also want to lift up the victims of the shootings in Boulder, Colorado. 
the shooting that happened right over here at Short Pump, the friends and the family of the young girl I was connected to Trinity United Methodist Church. The shooting that happened in Virginia Beach and the friends and the family of the 10 persons that were harmed and the two that lost their lives. There is much to pray for these days. And pray that we, that we would be used to offer God's grace and mercy throughout. We'll take this time to Pray as God is prompting us to pray, to lift up in however way that God would have you lift up. If you want to lift up out loud, please do so. If you want to lift up in the silence of your hearts, let me invite you to do that too, or just listen to Susan as she prayerfully plays for us. And I will end this time in the Lord's Prayer. Let's go to the Lord. all of these things in the name of the one who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation and deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right. I want to uh, bless uh, everyone who's on the online, uh, who's joining us online. I want to dim- dismiss you with this benediction at this time. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen. All right, so the online folks have been sent on their way. This is how I want to do this. There is an urging in my heart to sing. There is an urging that I can't contain sometimes. I think that's a lyric of a song. I'm not sure. Okay. I want to invite people who are uncomfortable in a crowd gathering singing. I want to bless you to, uh, to, to make your way to make your way. 